So we continue with a glance at Ephesians. You know, there are two volume commentaries written on the book of Ephesians, so there's a lot there. But we can certainly say, you know, based on the study of the words and of the book, that Ephesians affirms Christ as Lord. He's the Lord, even over this present darkness. And what was it, maybe 15, 20 years ago, there was a famous book, was it uh, Peretti? Frank Peretti, a book called This Present Darkness. And that's where he got the line. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. But Christ is Lord over the darkness. And um, what you have in your handout, you know, it's, it's, it's a very brief summary of some of the main doctrinal emphases in Ephesians. What is brought out a little bit more in the textbook, but what can still only you know, be briefly alluded to, uh, I call Ephesus the Disney world of the occult in the Roman Empire. It was the third largest city in the Roman Emperor, Empire. Uh, Rome, Alexandria, Ephesus. And there were seven wonders in the ancient world, and one of them was at Ephesus. And it was the Temple of Artemis, or Diana. Um, actually, the dean at Talbot Seminary out at uh, Biola University in La Mirada, California. He's a man named Clint Arnold, and, and Clint Arnold and I were in uh, grad school together, and his doctoral dissertation was published, and his doctoral dissertation was uh, on power and magic and, and Ephesians. It's, I'm sure it's in the bibliography at the end of the, the chapter on the prison epistles. And uh, he worked for three years on this issue of what he called the power language in Ephesians. And if you study Ephesians and look at how Christ is talked about, and I don't even know if I'm able to bring it out here. I don't really bring it out. So that's why I'm commenting on it now. Um, the scholars call the way that Christ is presented in Ephesians cosmic Christology. And by cosmic, the word in Greek for world is cosmos. And Christ is presented as the Lord over this world. Uh, when you read Romans... Jesus is called Lord, but the stress is on what we call soteriology, salvation. Jesus is the Lord who saves us. And I mean, that's perfectly legitimate. It's perfectly true. Um, but at Ephesus, remember when the church at Ephesus is founded in Romans chapter 19, how there are these Jewish exorcists and they're naming Jesus to try to uh, cast demons out of people. And they get in over their head. <laughs> and the demon-possessed guy mauls them all. Beats them up and rips their clothes off. And, and you know, I think they gave up exercising, at least in, uh, in that name. <laughs> and uh, also it's at Ephesus where there are riots because people had quit buying idols. And uh, it, it kind of shuts the city down because everybody is so given over to idolatry. And this is very true to what we know about the actual city of Ephesus at the time. And by occult, you know, occult means hidden. Uh, Christianity is a revealed religion. But there are religions... Uh, Satanic worship, for example, that you know you, you get into deep secrets, the black black magic, uh, black masses, 
you know, things that are dark and, and, and evil. And, uh, you know, people get scrambled and, and they get fascinated with the evil and they become enslaved by evil. And uh, we see this in the pages of Acts. There was a, a, a woman at Philippi who, she was a slave, and uh, she was taken to have some power of prophecy, and her owners made money off of her. You know, that's enslavement to some kind of a prophetic spirit. And Paul drove that spirit out of her in the name of Jesus. Well, this is the world that Ephesians uh, is addressing. And in this world <clears throat> where there's so much darkness, and as he says, where there are rulers and authorities and cosmic powers, Powers, you know, that means powers in the world. That's what cosmic means. It doesn't mean outer space. It means here on the cosmos. There, there are things at work that we can't see. But they, they are factors. They're factors in human behavior. They're factors in, in global movements. And, you know, we don't have to, uh, we don't have to seek these things out. Uh, we worship God. We worship a Lord over the powers of darkness. But it's folly not, it's folly to deny that these things are at work. I mean, how do you explain a Hitler? And uh, if any of you are, are old, uh, uh, Rock music devotees, you might remember that the Rolling Stones had a song. It was called Sympathy for the Devil. And uh, Mick Jagger, you know, takes on the voice of the devil in this song. And he says, please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste. Been around for many a year. Laid many a man's soul to waste. I was around when Jesus Christ had his moment of doubt and pain, made damn sure a pilot, wash his hands, and seal his fate. Pleased to meet you. Hope you get my name. Ah, but what's puzzling you is the nature of my game. And, he, and then he goes through world history. I was around St. Petersburg when I saw it was time for a change, you know, the Bolshevik Revolution. Killed the Tsar and his ministers. And then there's some words that I don't understand. And then my favorite line is, I rode a tank in the general's rank when the Blitzkrieg raged and the bodies stank. That's a pretty good rock line, isn't it? <laughs> that's, that's the devil's cosmic presence. ISIS. There's something going on there. And, and the depth of the evil and the depth of the delight you know, when there's murder and there's lies, there's the devil. That's what Jesus said. He's a murderer and he's a liar and the father of lies. And when people lie and kill, they're, they're doing the will of their father, and that's his nature. They're not doing something unusual if they're doing it in his power because that's his calling card. It's like Mick Jagger said. Pleased to meet you, hope you get my name. What's puzzling is the nature of my, this is the nature of his game. So Ephesians, it's, it's interesting, when you read scholarship, which scholarship in the West is not known for recognizing the power of evil, because it doesn't believe in miraculous. It doesn't believe in another world. It just believes in, you know, science and, and reason. It thinks. But when you read Ephesians with the eyeglasses, what does this have to say to the hidden world? What does it have to say to the powers of darkness that have a claim on our souls? It says Christ liberates us. And if you look for power language in Ephesians, uh, for example, in Ephesians chapter 1, there's a famous prayer near the end of the chapter, beginning with verse 19. He wants them to know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power? His power toward us who believe. According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And, you know, to you and I, we just hear the dead. But 
in Greek, that's ek nekron. It's from the corpses. From the corpses. That's, that's, that's the devil's playground, folks. Why, are, why is there death? There's death because of sin. And because of judgment. And that's where the devil wants to see people. But he raised him from the realm of the dead. He seated him in his right hand. That's God's throne. In the heavenly places, far above all rule, all authority, all power, all dominion, and above every name that is named. And in ancient black arts, and we've discovered papyri, we've discovered uh, uh, pottery that have long, long, long incantations and spells. And the idea was if you could say the right thing in the name of the right god or goddess, you could get results. You know, and we, we know what a spell is, right? Hexes and spells. This, this, these things have an ancient history, and people believed in them. Because they, they didn't, you know, they were polytheists and they didn't have anything else. And Paul is saying, I don't care what name you name. If you say it backward or forward, he has been seated above every name that is named. And not only in this eon, this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet. God put everything under Christ's feet. And then gave, there's one of those give words, gave him as head, the boss, over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So in a world where it seems like evil has a monopoly, a polytheistic world there are all kinds, there's, a, there's a, a temple to the emperor, there's the temple of Artemis, there are dozens of other shrines and centers of worship at Ephesus. There's only one ruler of the whole thing. And it doesn't look like he's the ruler of the whole thing, and especially when you look at the Christians, the Christians are a handful of people starting out. But Jesus' name is above every other name. And that's what Ephesians flushes out. It, flush, it flushes out the doctrine of a Christ who is Lord over the dark, dark circumstances of a place like St. Louis or East St. Louis or Belleville or Blackjack or South City. Uh, again, all you have to do to be reminded that we're no better and we're no different is just read the news. You know, did, did you read yesterday about, uh, I, I think I just kind of heard a bit of it, but I think it was a, a robbery attempt in St. Louis, and the people who did the robbery were using what looked like a police car. And they had police uniforms on. You know, it sounds like something in some other country <laughs> where these things are commonly done. But... It's coming to a neighborhood near you. You know, and my, my uh, son and daughter, who are in the Middle East, they, they live near Tower Grove Park. And uh, so far, they've been spared. But all the streets around them, you know, pretty regularly, when I turn on the news in the morning, uh, when I'm doing my stretching exercises, there's a reporter there. They're down there by Arsenal. They're down there, you know, somewhere in that South St. Louis neighborhood, and there's been somebody else shot. And a lot of times the circumstances are just, you know, they're just demonic. So uh, that's the world we're in. That's the world that Paul is writing to. And Christ is the Lord. A major stress of Ephesians is Christ's lordship over the everyday world. Cosmic Christology. He's king not only in matters of salvation, but ultimately over all world affairs. Other doctrinal emphases of, the letter, emphases of the letter include God's initiative and salvation. God chose and predestined according to the purpose of his will. I should have a quotation mark after will. This does not minimize the need for human faith and decision. It points to the work 
of God's grace in awakening humans to God, to seek God, rather to seek themselves. Human bondage to sin apart from Christ's liberation is a big part of the Ephesians. Without faith in him, we're dead in the trespasses and sins in which we once walked, following the course of this world. Next bullet point, the social dimension of the atonement. Chapter 2, verse 14. He is our shalom. He made us both one. He's broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. What's going on here is profound. Uh, as you look at that passage in chapter 2, you're going to see a word in verse 16 that's going to be hostility or enmity. Probably the last word of verse 16. He killed the hostility or he killed the enmity. And that word is also present in verse 14, the dividing wall of enmity or hostility. In the Greek Old Testament, when God pronounces the curse on Satan and then on the woman and then on the man, he tells the serpent, excuse me, He says, I'm going to put enmity between your seed and the seed of the woman. You know, people could have sinned against God, and God could have just said, tough luck, and just let them go on into the world, not being aware that something was wrong. But from that moment, the harmony that Adam and Eve knew was gone they began to be irritated with each other. And ever since the fall, enmity, hostility, has been a reminder that there's something wrong in the world. All of us have problems getting along with other people. We're turned in on ourselves. And there's a certain rancor <laughs> that arises in our social relations. And now you go through the, uh, the generations of human history and uh, migrations and the rise of ethnicities. And so we know Arabs hate Jews. And uh, if you go to Montana, there's enmity between the whites and the Native Americans. You wouldn't think of it, just watch the westerns, but when you go to Montana, you realize there's a history here and it's not nice. You go to St. Louis, guess what? You're going to find enmity. There are people that don't get along and they can identify themselves, in this case by skin color. If you go to Romania, there's a long history between the Romanians and the Hungarians and they hate each other. And you can go from village to village, and if you know what to look for, you know if you're in a Hungarian village or if you're in a Romanian village. And they may all be in Romania. Or you may be on the Hungarian side of the line, and that may, may be a Romanian village. And there are very hard feelings. Uh, years ago, there was a song, probably Frank Sinatra, Everybody Loves Somebody Sometime. It doesn't matter where you go in the world, everybody hates somebody. Just like you grew up and you were a, a, a Chevy family, your dad hated Fords. <laughs> you may have grown up in a family where you were one ethnicity, and in your family, another ethnicity was verboten. Uh, and now we call that, you know, there are ethnic slurs. They're called slurs now, but it, it wasn't that many years ago that every ethnicity had its term. And in St. Louis, you know, we, we have the hill. There used to be another word attached to that. And it can be kind of playful and innocent, but it can also pull back the, human, the, the cover of the human heart and remind us of how there is something there that makes us detest people that are different than we are, and we feel better. Um, 
I, was, I preached for a while in Chicago years ago. Uh, forgive me if I, if I mention this, but um, it was a white flight area. Looking back, I, I, I can see now. And uh, um, after, after one Sunday morning preaching, uh, the deacon, the main deacon, took me out to lunch, and, and his, uh, his wife was there with us, and they were from the south. This was South Chicago. And uh, he was telling me, explaining to me, you know, their church situation. And the whites were moving out, and, you know, black people were moving in. And, you know, he was trying, actually, he was kind of recruiting me to, to be considered to maybe receive a call at the church because I was preaching there and, you know, I was having a good time preaching and there were black folks in the church and white folks in the church. I, you know, I didn't know. I was a visiting preacher. But, so he was trying to say, talk about, the, you know, the future, the promise of ministry and how we can have, you know, a church where people work together. And his wife was just kind of picking out her food and, and finally she just kind of sighed and she said, uh, all I know is that every time I shake one of those people's hands, it makes my skin crawl. That's in the church. And that's not unusual. When you get to know people on your church role. Now, hopefully, it's not, you know, your good folks in the church that are doing the Lord's work. I mean, that racism should not be a part of a Christian in fellowship with God. But there are lots of people associated with the church that have these deep, deep antagonisms. Back to the cross, Christ died to put to death the enmity. And a lot of people are clinging to this view, I'm saved because I accepted Jesus, but I hate black people. Or I hate white people. And that's why... Right here, the social dimension of the atonement. If the cross didn't change how we feel about other people, then it didn't change our heart. It didn't change your heart. Because Christ's cross didn't come just to save your soul. Christ saving your soul is a part of his cosmic redemption. And his cosmic redemption is reconciling people who are in the darkness of hatred. Right? On, remember Jesus said if you are angry with somebody, you've committed murder. When, when we are in Christ, that really ratchets back the anger factor. And it puts pressure on us. I remember pressure was on me as a 9, 10, 11 year old because I had learned that we all come from Adam and Eve. That's still the bedrock of social reconciliation in the world. We all come from Adam and Eve. And so we played baseball against a team in Valley Park and in our conference the old, that was the only team that had black players. And they had a really good guy. His name was Mike. And we battled. I, I was in the, on the Murphy team, Murphy playing Valley Park. And we battled. And I think well, they won one and we won one. But, you know, Mike was their pitcher. He was kind of their captain. I was the catcher on my team. And I remember we had this one victory. We won three to one. But it, I think we, in the last inning we scored a couple runs and broke a tie. And the big question was, were you going to shake hands? And I knew, yeah. And, you know, we were an all-white team. And, of course, at nine years old, back in the 60s, you, you weren't socially conscious. I just knew what a racist my father was. Plus, that old field in Valley Park, it was right in the middle of, of, of factories, and there was a paint factory with a large tower. And when you played baseball, there were all these guys, all white guys, looking down, you know, is the night shift. They're all looking down. It's a, a lit field. And so... You just, you just felt like the spotlight of the world was on you. And I remember lining up afterward, and I knew that a lot of the players, I mean, they talked about in the dog, they weren't going to shake so-and-so's hands. And I remember that I had to. I had to shake Mike's hand. And, you know, we exchanged a few words, like good game or something. And I just remembered how much I admired him. Because he was one of only two or three blacks on his team. But, you know, he had such dignity, and he just... 
He didn't pay attention to what he knew people thought of him. He just, he, he just carried himself as a human being, and he, he didn't hold it against me that I had teammates that weren't going to shake his hand. And I really think that that was the power of the gospel, the truth of the Bible, working in my life, the work of the Holy Spirit through knowing what, what's, true about the, what's true about the world. God made people one. And sin divides people. And one of the major reasons that the, the, cro the cross is so desperately needed in our world today because people are killing each other. And they will not stop killing each other if they don't find peace. It's going to keep going. And you and I are living in a social order where we have mediating institutions, like, like, like police forces and, and education and business and stuff, and we think we don't need the church, we don't need Christ for peace. But you, you, you let civilization go on more and more and more without the effect of Christ in it, in people, nothing will be safe. Nowhere will be safe. And that's the way it is in much of the world. Because it's lacking the work of the cross in the lives of people to provide them with the resources to cut slack for each other. And to be open to each other. And to be kind to each other. And to defend the dignity and the rights of each other. And to that's what love others means. It doesn't mean to sit passively and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not killing anybody. I, I love everybody. It's in our active lives that we are positively disposed to other people, and, and our lives are lives of service that benefit others. And then that's the lordship of Christ. And, you know, I, I think I saw a little bit of that yesterday. Is it, is it, is it poor folks that eat here on Friday night? So they're recovering from substance stuff? Yeah. So this church, is it just Friday night? But okay, so this church... Okay, so this church has an outreach to people celebrating recovery. And it's, that's, that's, that's what we're talking about. You know, this church has a desire to extend itself and to bless individuals who've had a tough go, and they're recovering. And it's an encouragement to them, I'm sure. And that's, that's, you know, it's a small thing, but you add that up, and it makes a real difference in the world. So Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2 more than any other single place in all of Scripture. Like, like, if you want justification, go to Romans. But if you want social reconciliation, Ephesians 2, beginning there in verse 11. That is what we call the locus classicus, L-O-C-U-S, which is a Latin word for location. It's the classical passage for how the cross changes how people get along with each other and why there should not be racism in churches where Christ is Lord. Now, if culture is Lord, if you've got a confederate church, or you have a PC church, then that justifies contempt for all kinds of people. You know, I, 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 I'm in, in academic settings a lot. And academic people are educated, and you know they, they more, they're more white collar socially, and it's really cool when you're an academician. Hopefully, not a Christian academician, but not that many Christians. I mean, not that many academicians are Christian. But there are people that are deplorable. You know, and if you're in that class, it's just a given. There are these horrible people out there, and we got to do something about them. We've got to manage them. We've got to control them. We've got to penalize them. Um, it's no better if you're a racist and you're a PhD than if you're a racist and you're a redneck in a trailer cart, a trailer court. And uh, I was born in a trailer court. 
uh, where the Chrysler plant used to be, there used to be an old 66, a trailer court there. And that's where my mother and father lived until I was uh, three years old. I lived in that trailer court. So I got credentials <laughs> all right, to talk about trailer courts. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if you're trailer court or if you're a uh, PhD, when you have contempt for other people, you cannot claim to be a Christian. Now, maybe you are, and this is just an area on God's list, and he's going to deal with you. And I know none of us is perfect, and in any given circumstance, you know, we might have revulsion about a person um, because we're sinners. Um, you, you get on a plane, and somebody sits down to you, and they're really smelly, you may feel something not pleasant about that person. Um, but you know what I'm talking, you know what, we know what racism is. And uh, this is one of the major points of Ephesians, is that Christ's cross puts to death the enmity and unites, there are two kinds of people in the world, there are God's people and there are not God's people. And when he says, makes the two one, he's talking about the Jews who are on paper, on paper they're God's people and the Gentiles on paper are not God's people. And all people are made one. Whether they're Jew or Gentile, whether they're barbarian or, or free or slave or male or female, you know, there are men who have contempt for women. And it's getting worse because of pornography. There are men who, it's awful, just across the board, how they regard women. And they're not capable of a, of a brotherly friendliness towards women because women are objectified in their lives, and they have, they have black hearts and souls. And they've been given over to things that have dehumanized them, and, and in their minds, women are dehumanized. The gospel comes, and it makes it possible for us to have a change of heart and a change of character so that men and women can begin to rediscover what it means to be brother and sister. And we need that desperately in our world today. And you need five minutes. I'll see you. Goodbye.